And I hope I can help everybody today to see a way of turning your radio on to hear God. That's the whole point. That's the beauty of the Christian walk. That is the reward we get and the treasure we find is to hear a word from heaven. You see, if you got the handout in the bulletin, we're in Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 2. Today, and this is the final part of a four-part series on hearing God, how to hear God, how to dial into God, and how to know that it's God you're hearing. On Wednesday, we talked about your FM radio line being, thinking, I know this is data technology, but that the clearest signal was always the FM signal. You could get a clear song, a clear talk show through the FM. That's, metaphorically speaking, your Bible. I wanted that one to take preeminence. I wanted that one to be the primary way that you hear from God is by spending time in the Scriptures. You won't regret it. Today I want to talk about your AM radio. Now the AM is maybe in your mind slightly diminished. It's these weird talk shows. It's more staticky. It's harder to get a clear signal. Don't take that metaphor too far. If it is a step below the Bible, this, this thing, this entity we're going to talk about today is a, getting transmissions from heaven, it's a very small step. This is, this is the big guns here. How to hear from God. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Tongues, right? We're talking about hearing. We're talking about God's word. And lo and behold, we see tongues, and it's tongues of fire. All of them, these people gathered together in one place, you see where this is going, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they begin to, guess what? Speak. Again, hearing words, hearing from God. We've got tongues of fire, and now we're speaking. We speak, but we speak here in other tongues. They begin to speak in other languages as the Spirit, capital S, enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, and when they heard, 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 that's what we're here to learn how to do, is to hear, to hear. They heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. I mean, you got all these people speaking all these different languages all of a sudden. And so they heard this, and they gathered together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. All right, this is the point of the story. If the tongues of fire didn't do it, this is where we've crossed the threshold well into the supernatural. This is a miracle at this point. You can't speak a bunch of different languages and be heard by a bunch of different people who interpret different languages, and it all makes sense to everybody. It'd be like the United Nations Conference without the interpreter. It won't work. We're all speaking. Ever since the Tower of Babel, there's been this great inefficiency among humans that we all speak different languages. But here, everybody heard everything and heard it all clearly. Utterly amazed at this miracle, they asked, uh, I'm in verse 7 now, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya, Hawkinsville, Cochrane, Georgia, Alabama, the U.S., and Mexico. How is this possible? Visitors from Rome, Jews, converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for a chance to gather. I thank you for that song. I thank you for the spirit that might be in this place if we let it, and I pray that we'll let it. May this next little time be divinely protected from distractions, from intrusions, and from untruths. May everything I say be the gospel truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What does this mean? Now, I didn't read verse 13 because I don't like it, but it's there and you can't miss it now that I've mentioned it. Some people made fun of them. They've had too much wine. So that proves, this proof that some things never change. There's people making fun of you right now. There go the churchgoers. 
going to do that church thing. They like to wear their clothes. The only reason they go is so they can have one day to put on the nice clothes. People making fun of you. Maybe they think you've had too much wine. I don't know. What are you getting out of this church thing? So I'm just going to kind of ignore verse 13, assuming that we don't have to spend too much time on it. What does this mean? So uh, number one, if you're filling out the worksheet there, why waste time? Let's get right to it. The church. Church. Capital C. Church is your AM radio. It is the other great receiver of words from God. Bible preeminence. Everything we say and do in church, everything we say and do outside of church, if you want to know if it's true or not, let's see if it comports, if it aligns with Scripture. That's always a good litmus test of truth. But I do believe, and this is important, and this divides me from some soulless Scripture theologians, I believe God says other things. I believe God speaks to me. I believe God speaks to you. I believe that's really the beauty of the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, when we say sola scripture, what we mean, like scripture alone, what we mean is that, yes, this is the book. We do not mean that God has somehow zipped his mouth shut and refused to speak to mankind. That's, to me, that just negates the whole beauty of the Christian walk. To hear from God is everything. You do want to make sure as much, you know, that it aligns with what you know from studying the scriptures and from learning the scriptures, but God is here. The, the reason we're here, what, what did it say in Acts? Gathered all together in one place. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound oddly similar to the, exactly what you're doing right now? We're gathered in one place expecting something. And may God deliver that something here and now, today. It's not later, not next time, not gathered together. They all heard them speaking in their languages, which was a miracle and they wondered at it. You may already be thinking, well, this doesn't apply. We all speak English, and so it's just not really surprising that I'm speaking English and you're hearing English and understanding it. Look, you don't have to take a big stretch away from the text to realize, you ever had that feeling that the preacher's saying something directly to you? Okay, English, Spanish, whatever, let's not get hung up on the language thing. How did the preacher know I was going through that particular thing? How could he know? I haven't told anybody. Nobody knows that I'm going through that. And yet, here he is preaching about it at the exact moment that I needed to hear that thing. That's a miracle. That is no less of a miracle than someone speaking English and someone who only speaks Spanish understanding it at the same time like they do here. God knows and he will send you the word. And there are faithful ministers all across the country, all around the world, giving sermons now, having no real idea what they're doing in the sense that they don't know the impact that they're making in people's lives because we don't know what people are going through. We just try to be faithful to the word. The Holy Spirit interprets. Dwayne and I were talking uh, about one of the sermons the other day I gave, and he was talking about how he chases he, something I will say maybe not even a main point, will lead his mind going down a different route. And it, it led him the other day to a Frank McCourt, and he was sharing with me about a Frank McCourt book that I might enjoy reading. And so, I never heard of Frank McCourt, you know? <laughs> and, but it led him that direction. You ever have that experience? Now look, I'm not advocating daydreaming <laughs> during the sermon, but I'm saying we need to lean into that, that process. That is a good and healthy process that your mind might hear something and it chases, your brain alone chases this rabbit down this trail, I think that might well be a process worth paying attention to, the Holy Spirit leading you to some thought that's not even necessarily in the message or wasn't even a big part of the message. Might have been in the song service. Lean into that, I say. The other night, and if you were here on Wednesday night, this, would, this is going to be the same night as the Acts night. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not sharing that story again. But the other night, Jay was preaching. I was listening, and I had made up my mind as, as the blood was boiling, not at Jay, at my life and things and struggles and so forth, and I, I, was, I was like, I'm going to stop, I'm going to talk to him after the service, not like just a hey, how are you kind of talk, I'm going to see if he'll sit with me for a minute in the office, and I just want to share some things with him, and I tell you this, in all honesty, I was just at the point in my mind of thinking, and what I'm going to tell him, quite frankly, I'm going to tell him, Jay, I really just don't feel like God cares. It was a very candid thing to think and uh, would have been a very candid thing to say, but the point of the story is, I'm, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not trying to be dramatic, this is how it happened. 
Jay's up there preaching while my mind is, I wouldn't call that daydreaming, I, whatever that was, thinking, pondering, meditating on the Word. And the minute, the, the very second that my mind said, I don't think God cares, Jay, who's preaching out of the book of James, having no idea what I'm thinking, said at that exact moment, God cares. And I'm going to hold on to that story for a long time because that, is a pow that was a powerful, powerful moment and a reminder. And that happens, quite frankly, all the time to people who come to church faithfully and prayerfully. Not like a, let's get this over with so we can get the huddle house kind of going. You may, it may not happen to you much there. But if you're coming with the right spirit, like this is the priority time of your week, of all the hours of the week, 24 times 7, work that out later, this is the hour that you put at the pinnacle. This is the start of your week, the kickoff of the, this is opening ceremonies for your week. I think stories like that will happen in your life a lot. And one of my favorite parts about the story, and I've shared this before in this series, is that Jay plans his sermons like way in advance. So the thing that I was going through hadn't even happened yet when he put pen to paper to write the sermon. How is that possible? It's the sovereignty of God. That's the sovereignty of God. God knows the God's already there. He's, he's ever present, past, present, and future. He is omnipresent. God knew. And to think of just the awesome responsibility and the humbling, just the humbling opportunity to be the one who wrote those words of that sermon from the book of James, not knowing fully what God was doing with the, the, the brush of the pen. That's you and me talking to one another. These conversations in the hallway, these messages from the pulpit, the talking we do in the front yard afterwards, the Sunday school, confessions, prayers, lessons. Wow. Remember, did y'all catch Sunday school's lesson today? Speak the truth boldly. What a day for that lesson. It really fits. I say, I suggest, lean in to that process. It's a God thing. All right, point number two. Why do you come to church? We all need to take an honest assessment, a good, prayerful, quiet assessment of that question. Why do you come to church? Now, in Ezekiel, here's one reason that they didn't call it church then, but here's one reason that people came to hear the preaching of the prophet Ezekiel. And uh, I've I've printed the main part in your handout. I'm going to read a little bit before that, so just hang on, because this is, this is just perfect, isn't it? Ezekiel 33, as, this is God talking, as for you, son of man, talking to Ezekiel, your people are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors. Now, luckily, in the year 2023, nobody talks about their preacher at the walls or by the doors, so this is very old manuscript. But try to use your imagination of a world where people talk about their preacher by the wall and by the doors. But your people are talking about you. But, and you think like, oh, they're gossiping, they're slandering the preacher, all that stuff. No, they're actually complimenting him in this. Listen to this. Now, I know it's not in your, your printout yet, but we'll get there. They're talking about you saying, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. And my people are coming to you as they usually do, 11 a.m. Sunday morning. They sit before you, pews, to hear your words, but they don't put them into practice. And here's the part I printed because I just thought it was jam up. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice, sings love songs with a beautiful voice, and plays an instrument well. In other words, hey, y'all need to come hear this preaching. Y'all need to come hear He's a good speaker. It's entertaining to hear this rhetoric. It's entertaining to sit under such an... And, and preachers all around the world are, are in this dilemma of... We want to be good speakers. We want it to be engaging. We want it to be clear as crystal. We want it to be logically ordered. We want all that as an aside, in the same way that I want to wear clothes that don't distract you. If I was up here in blue jeans and tennis shoes at this church, it might be distracting. I don't want to do, but that can't be the thing that we're here to see or the thing that we're here to do. Come, come hear the preacher. He wears a nice suit. Come hear the preacher. He gives a good, he's a good orator. He's a good speaker. That's like someone who plays an instrument well. It becomes a concert. It's entertaining, 
but they don't put them into practice. They hear your words. Remember, we've, we started this whole series in Isaiah 6. They hear, but they don't hear. Ever hearing, but never understanding. Ever seeing, but never... They hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Now, I'm not saying that's us. I'm actually not saying this at all. This is God to the prophet Ezekiel thousands of years ago. You got to decide, Cinderella, if the shoe fits. Okay, I can't do that for you. I'm just saying there was a time when people only came to hear the preacher because it was entertaining, because he was a good orator, like someone who plays the guitar entertainingly. But there's kind of a foreboding ending to this verse. You see there printed, when all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And that one makes me shudder. Go to that revival, tent revival, that preacher, that revival, he's just going to fire everybody up and get everybody so excited, it's going to be great, and there'll be fried chicken afterwards, I can't wait. But then there will come a day when some people who heard but didn't hear are going to realize, oh, hell, he was really talking about a place. And that's horribly sad. They find themselves in, in either brokenness and despair on the earth, or maybe they live in luxury and whatever their whole life and find themselves in brokenness and despair, like the rich man and Lazarus, in the afterlife. It's going to be a real heartbreaker for them to realize when all this comes true, all those things that revival meeting, pre meeting preacher was saying comes true, and it surely will then they will know. But the scary part is maybe then it's too late. Don't let that be you. I hope to speak clearly. I hope every preacher speaks clearly. That's not why we're here. Why do you come to church? C.S. Lewis said this. This is from his uh, arguably his most famous book, Mere Christianity. He's talking about the church. Like, what is the church? What is church? What is, what is this thing where we're gathered? Uh, and the day of Pentecost, they were all gathered together in one place. What is this gathering? And uh, he said, already the new men, Christians, are dotted all over the earth. Some are hardly recognizable, but others can be recognized. Talking about Christians. Every now and then one meets them. Their voices and faces are different. When you've recognized one of them, you'll be able to recognize the next one more easily. And I strongly suspect, but how should I know, that they recognize one another immediately and infallibly across every barrier of color, sex, class, age, and even of creeds. Joining the church... To become holy is rather like joining a secret society. To put it at its very lowest, it must be great fun. <laughs> Y'all, I'll tell you, number three, just to, I want to stress this so much. Your membership in this thing that we got going on right here, it is global. It is global. And it is is serious. If no one's ever told you that, I want to be the one to tell you that. Robin and I went, this is the only big, big trip we've had. It was a 10-year anniversary this summer. We went to Massachusetts, went to Boston. Wes Young got on an airplane <laughs> for quite possibly the last time. I do not enjoy flying. Trains, ships, cars, excellent. But we got there. Stayed several days. It was, it, was, it was very powerful to see those places where the founding fathers and so forth, a lot of history there. And we were going to leave on a Sunday, if I'm remembering this right. And one of the things I've really come to like to do when we travel anywhere is to visit a church. But we had to catch a plane at like 11 or so, which is normally 11 or 12 when the church would normally be getting started. So I did my Googling. There was one church in the whole city of Boston that was meeting for a sun, just an early morning, kind of a sunrisey service. Uh, they called it Morning Mass, so you can pick the denomination out of that. That'll do. This is my family. 
Y'all, I am miles from home in a place where everybody recognizes my Georgia accent and made a point to tell me about it. And I got up at six and walked, you know, very walkable city most of the time, and walked several, several blocks, half lost, and wholly excited to go to this church I'd never heard of with people I'd never met. The only thing I knew about them was that something started at 7. And I walked in there all by myself at 7 a.m. to, a, to a, a sanctuary, a room full of complete strangers, and I felt the same as if I had just walked in to Thanksgiving dinner with my family. It is bizarre, isn't it? Your membership in the church, capital C, it is global. It is global. You are in this fellowship of believers that extends far outside of yourself, outside of limestone. And I have stories like that from several times out of town where I just go to these churches with people I've never met and we're singing songs to God together and afterwards we're talking like we're old friends. It's like we knew a secret handshake or something. It's like we knew that connection of this divine Holy Spirit thing that we're here for. And that, I like that. The, the Boston one's my favorite because most of my other ones are Baptist churches. The Boston's one of my favorite because it was even cross-denominational. And I'm not saying everybody's right and everything. I'm just, obviously, I'm not saying. I'm just saying they are part of my family. These were Franciscan friars. They were wearing the brown robes with the hoods. Okay, <laughs> Baptist. <laughs> And yet, somehow, it was just perfect. And I was, I was very impressed. In moments like that, I'm very impressed by what it means to be a member of the church. The problem is, really the ultimate problem of the whole thing is, you, you can't get the fruit, you can't get the harvest without the garden, right? Said the little red hen, okay? And I, that's really where the whole thing falls apart. You know, hey, that secret society, friends across the world, I could travel to any country and find connections like this sort of great fraternity, sorority, brotherhood, this international thing. That sounds great, but you can't have the harvest. You can't have the hearing without the garden. So you're already in Acts chapter 2. Flip over. Let's see some gardening. There is work involved in this. Go to verse 40, please. Verse 40 of Acts chapter 2. With many other words, he warned them. Yeah, verse 40 there. He warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And so, there, in other words, don't get bogged down in that. There was a preacher, they're having church now. This is Acts, the story of the first church. They're having church now and the preacher's preaching a sermon. And those who accepted his message, praise God, were baptized. Been doing a lot of that lately. Not a coincidence. And 3,000 were added to their number that day. Jay, we haven't got to 3,000 yet since you got here, but I have noticed things happening. I believe in you. I'm ready for, you know. They, look at this. They, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Can I say Wednesday night? And to prayer. That sounds awfully familiar to the things we do. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles, and the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together. We're more on the two-day-a-week plan now, all right? But it's okay to hang out with each other outside of church, right? Go to the huddle house. Go to Scott's. Go golfing with John. I hear he cheats a little, but it's okay. It's all right. But Sunday and Wednesday, we certainly got... They were meeting every day in whatever capacity that is. Every day they came to meet together. They broke bread in their homes. Wouldn't that be nice? Ate together, glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, it, it, it's not just going to happen. You, you got you to tend the garden. That bit about... the Of all of that sounds pretty good, but the... You know, the, the hardest part of the tending this garden is selling all our possessions and having things in common. Ugh. That sounds, so we've got to be socialist. Or, you know, there's, there's a whole thing we could do on this, but I'm just saying if somebody needs something, come on, now we're a family. It's okay to loan it to them. The other day, Stella asked if I could uh, get the brotherhood kind of going to go pressure wash uh, Fred and Gail's front porch. 
Absolutely, I said. Then thinking, I don't have a pressure washer. So I go to Curtis. Ask Curtis if I can borrow a pressure washer. He lets me borrow his pressure washer, no problem. Gasses it up. No strings attached. He actually brought it to me on his golf cart. We met him halfway by accident, but he was going to bring it all the way to my house. So now I've got a pressure washer. Well, there's, there's, more, there's vines to clip and things as other people start showing up. And we're, we're pressure washing and clipping and cleaning. And so now we've, we've gone through three iterations of different people helping people out. We're in the fourth, all this group together. And then so it got done. I hope the porch looks a little better or whatever. But as, as life went on the other day, I needed to borrow a, uh, it's not an axe. We went down that Wednesday. No. Uh, what do, a bush hook or something. I had to get Kirby Smith to tell me what. I knew what it looked like, but I didn't know what it was called. And I needed one. And it was Wednesday night, I was just talking about it, and Fred heard me and said, I've got one. And you said, come by any time and get it. And if I'm not there, here's where it is. That's it, y'all. That's what we're talking about. That, you see how that came full circle? Wow. You know, we're a part of that. This, this is the plan. This is the thing. This is what we fall back on, who we lean on, who we call when we need something, who we pray with, who we loan and borrow things. It's a give and take. It's a relationship. And in the middle of that relationship, the Holy Spirit and the Spirit between believers grows and speaks and teaches. And all I'm going to say before I leave point three behind is your membership in this thing is a big deal. It is serious. I'm going to tell you frankly, and this is one of those, thank goodness the Sunday school lesson said we can speak hard truths. So I'm going for it. I would not put my name on a church roster if I was not plugged into that church. I wouldn't do it. I know this is a little bit like saying, if uh, we're going to take attendance. If you're not here, raise your hand. Okay, to, to, <laughs> to say this to the people who are here is kind of pointless. But look, you know, every church, I suppose, has this problem of you've got names on the list of people we've never met, don't see, but I, I guess they want like front row planning in the cemetery when the day comes. Look, you can spread my ashes anywhere. I am not, I am not putting my name on a roster of an organization if I'm not plugged into it, because my name means something. You're what we call in Baptist circles, your letter. Ask Peggy Phillips about the letters. She keeps, she's the custodian of the letters, our letters. That is your membership in the church. That's a big deal. If I wasn't coming, if I wasn't plugged in, or even if I wasn't on board, if, if I can't submit to Dwayne leading my family in praise, I'm totally good with you leading us. Teach us how to praise. I'll do it with you. Jeb, raising my children in the gospel, te helping and learning through him. I'm good. I am submitting to y'all's leadership. Y'all realize Limestone has a... I'm getting wound up here. We have, we have a fully staffed church. Amen. I am so happy that it hadn't been that way for we, we, But we're there. Are we really going to not submit to this beautiful thing that we have? Teach me how to worship. Teach my kids the gospel. Pastor Jay, the senior pastor, lead me. Say those messages out of James so that when I'm in the congregation and I'm having these dark thoughts about God doesn't care, the very words God cares will come out of your mouth. I am willing to submit. Lead me. I will follow. I can be a sheep. I am okay with me and my family being a sheep. Let's not ruin this thing because of pride or just not being here or because we, we, we don't even really have anything to do with limestone. We just want that good burial plot when the time comes. Get your name off the roster. I would not put my name on a roster any more than I would co-sign a loan, a mortgage loan for somebody I've never met or somebody I don't spend any time with. You can forget that. <laughs> Get your name off the roster. Or there is another option. Plug in healthfully. But it's, you, you can't do this lukewarm, there, there be no road between. Quite frankly, people know that a church is a church. I got blessed out by a guy a few years ago, and I just happened to know what church he went to. And this is illogical and unfair, but I thought less of everybody at that church for quite a while. All right? I don't want you flying the limestone flag or wearing the limestone jersey or anything, putting the limestone bumper sticker on your car if you're not limestone because you represent us all. Plug in or get out. And I'd prefer you to plug in. And again, here we are. If you're not here, raise your hand, but I'm just saying, maybe Jesus is just saying, a little more seriously, Matthew chapter 18. You don't have to turn there, I'll tell you. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And maybe, just maybe, your name on a church roster means a heck of a lot more than you bargained for when you put it down there. Think these things through, and let's do this thing right. 
So I bring you to the last point. We'll close out with this. I'll get you to fill in that thing in just a second. It's from Revelation chapter 3. It's, 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 it's a good one to finish with. I asked you why you came to church. I'm going to tell you why I come to church before I share the Revelation bit. And uh, incidentally, I'm going, to, I'm going to explain this to you the only way I really know how anymore, and it's, I'm going to tell you the, this, this is my favorite scene from any movie in the history of movies. Okay, so... If the sermon has bored you up until this point, at least if you ever find yourself in a Wes Young trivia game, you'll get this question right. What is Wes Young's favorite scene of any movie ever in the history of movies? All right, here it is. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to tease, but I'm not going to tell you the title of the movie because I don't really like the movie. i got some problems with the movie. But there's this scene that just, it moved me. And has, it just, every time I think about it, it moves me. And it's the, the storyline is there's this meteor that's going to destroy the entire earth indisputable fact everybody knows we're, this is it this is the last day and at the end of the movie and the big chunks of the meteor are breaking off early and just it's just explosions everywhere and it shows this scene of a character that hadn't been in the movie the whole time we've never seen him we don't know anything about him but he's this tribal priest in his full religious garb and he has gone to the top of this mountain look it looks like maybe the upper heights of Hawaii or something. I don't know where he is, but he's, he's in this full religious garden. He's got his drum, and the meteor is just falling down, and he is just dancing. And he is just beating that drum, knowing that he is about to die. And he is going to worship his God as the sky falls. That's my favorite scene out of any movie, because when I saw it, I was like, that is Wes Young going to church. That is exactly how I feel in this climate, in this world, in this culture, going to church. By golly, I'm going to worship God while this ship sinks. And that's the way it's going to be, and that is what going to church is. Do not go quietly into that good night. We can live and die worshiping God fearlessly. They can't take that away from us. They didn't take it away from Jesus with the last nail in the cross. And by God's grace, they don't have to take it away from you. But the rub is, and this is Revelation chapter uh, 3. This is Jesus Christ talking to the churches, the seven churches, that famous bit where he's talking to the seven churches in Asia Minor in the last book of the Bible. And he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and that's what this, been, this whole sermon series has been about, if anyone hears my voice and does this simple, Renee is going to the door. Oh, my gosh. You say, if there's a knocking out there, I need to know about it. <laughs> anyone who hears my voice and does this simple thing, open the door, I'll come in and eat with that person. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Preachers have been using this line for years as a personal evangelism line. And it's good for that. A little out of context, but it's good. The, the fact that you're lost, God is knocking on the door of your heart, let him in. We have hymns about that. We have evangelistic sermons about that. That's, I, that's great. That is true. But just know that in the original context, it's clearly to the churches. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. People who already know God, who already are saved, who already are born again, and Jesus is on the outside knocking and just saying, if you'll just open the door, I will come in there. Hear my voice. I want to be in there. He's right there, y'all. I'd like everybody to stand to your feet, please, as the musicians come forward. If everybody stand, please. And as the musicians are coming forward, I'm just going to ask you to, to close your eyes. I'm going to say a prayer here. And in this prayer and in this moment, after all this work has been done and everything's been sung and said, I just want to think, do we hear that knocking? Do we hear Jesus wanting to say something, wanting to be a part, wanting to move, and wanting to do? Father, I pray for everyone in this church, and I love them. Thank you for them. I thank you that my family is so welcome here and always has been since the very beginning. 
There's people in this church practically raising my kids alongside of me and Robin. That's just incredible, incredible. I pray your blessing on everyone here. And if, if, Lord, if you're knocking on anyone's heart or if you're knocking on our doors and you've got something in mind that you want to say, we're all ears. And we would like very much to hear from you, to be doers of whatever we hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.